Well, welcome. Good morning. Uh, we, don't, we don't often do panel discussions uh, at an Acres USA conference, but we've never before had such an assembly of people that, that uh, deserve a panel discussion. And they have a unified message, but they will also uh, uh, have their own uh, unique additions to the discussion of regenerative agriculture. Uh, we're happy to have with us today Dr. Vandana Shiva, who is a worldwide leader in seed saving and in farmers' rights and in taking on the, the agrochemical companies that are doing such damage to people and the planet. Uh, Ronnie Cummins is a founder of uh, Organic Consumers and Regeneration International and a, a longtime ad, uh, activist and advocate for uh, clean food and clean farming. Andre Loy is a longtime organic farmer himself and then president of Organic Farmers of Australia. He's the longest serving uh, president of the IFOM, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements. And they, they each travel the world, uh, testify to governments worldwide, and work with farmers. Uh, so from the farm to uh, policy room. Um, we're going to, the format of this morning is each, uh, each speaker is going to uh, you know, have, their, have their words and then we hope to have some time for questions at the end. So we'll ask that any questions, if you will have people with three by five cards, if you can pass them to us, we'll get to as many questions at the end of the panel as we can. So uh, with that, we, we'll, we'll start with uh, Dr. Shiva. Hello, everyone. Um, I think the fact that we've come together as the movement for regenerative agriculture is both part of the imperative of the urgency, because we are living through multiple emergencies. But I think there's an added emergency that those who've created the problem are using exactly the same mindset and the same tools to use the crises they have created for their next market, for their next commodification. And that's why we really have to both widen our alliances, deepen our knowledge, and elevate our consciousness at the same time. For too long, we spent time thinking, I'll only be local. I used to make that decision again and again. And then World Bank would do something. World Trade Organization would come up. The poison cartel would emerge with GMOs. And then you had to say, no, got to do both together. And fortunately, being very rooted in place and being very deep in a planetary consciousness is totally possible. Because we don't live in an either or world. I see five major emergencies that are part of that degeneration model. And the degeneration will be accelerated when each of these is treated separately in a silo, because that's where the opportunism of turning the crisis into the next market comes up. The first is the degradation and degeneration of our planetary systems, because the Earth as a whole is a self-organized living system which is why James Lovelock, the NASA scientist, after he realized she's regulating her temperature, she's regulating her biosphere through the biodiversity of life, and that the tiniest of microbes is playing a role in this self-organization. The disruption of those planetary systems with the two big disruptions, the species extinction, the biodiversity erosion, and uh, the climate disasters and the havoc. I think the degradation of our political systems, I don't have to tell you. It's now so obvious. The dissent is really into absolute chaos, if it's not turned around with the deeper democracy movement. The degradation of the economic systems. You experienced it in the 2008 crisis. Europe experienced it in the 2010 crisis. But the polarization of the world into the 1% and the 99%, and now a whole new language being used of 99% will be useless people. 
you know, first they say we don't need farmers, we'll have chemicals and giant machines to replace them. Then they brought in the drones and the glyphosate spray. Now they're talking the language of farming without farmers. Monsanto's latest now is digital agriculture. But do they even know the life of the soil? No, they don't. They just know they pumped huge amounts of nitrogen fertilizer and all of their artificial intelligence is reducing it by 2%. That's their artificial intelligence. So Monsanto just bought up the world's biggest climate data corporation, the world's biggest soil data corporation. They're planning three trillion in insurance business from farmers annually with the combination of this data. Because as they're saying increasingly, the new oil is big data. And I always say, small data is still data, still pieces of disembodied information. It's not knowledge, it's not awareness of interconnectedness. It's definitely not wisdom to choose the right action. It's still data. So making that absence of wisdom and absence of knowledge bigger means just more ignorance and more immorality. So it's big crimes. The economic systems in decay and polarization, the food and health systems being degraded, both the health of the soil, the health of the planet, the health of people, and the social systems. Combination of the fact that when people are insecure, they do start thinking of the other person as a threat. But then when you have a 1% economy, it starts to mobilize that insecurity for polarization. And the combination of the, you know, it's a bit like desertified soil without humidity, without water carrying capacity. And we did a manifesto, Terra Viva, uh, in which we just told everyone, send the names for human in your language. So the word human is derived from humus, the soil, the living soil. And the first human being, according to uh, the Abrahamic tradition, Adam, is derived from Adamus, the soil. We just have another name for the soil. And as long as we don't know that, as long as we are aware of that, there are two other words that are derived from humus. Humility, humidity. And all of this holds society together. The absence of it is tearing society apart. Just like we are desertifying the soil, we are desertifying our souls. And then it's impossible to live together. And so for us, regenerative org organic agriculture is about addressing each of these emergencies in a way that's totally doable given the work you all have done. The planetary system, you know, we, I wrote Soil Not Oil before the Copenhagen summit, partly because we'd seen how it would be, the treaty would be killed and it would be turned into a voluntary commitment, but also because agriculture was not even being talked. And our work in India was showing how agriculture, the wrong kind of agriculture, fossil fuel driven, chemical driven, is the biggest problem, and good ecological farming is the biggest solution. So we've just done a 20 year study. Organic matter has increased in our valley on organic farms by up to 99%. It's gone down 14% in the chemical farms. Nitrogen has gone down 22% where they're applying urea with lots of enthusiasm to increase nitrogen. And it's gone up 100% in the areas where we don't apply urea because now the earthworms and the soil organisms are doing all the amazing work. Zinc has gone up, manganese has gone up, and everywhere it's going down. These are the reasons. The carelessness with respect to the soil is the reason for the micronutrient deficiency in the soil in our food, in our bodies. And I asked the scientist who does this work with us, he's India's top soil ecologist, I said, turn this into the amount of organic matter. It's 2.2 tons per hectare, which is the figure we worked out in Paris. 
that that's what we need worldwide. And within 10 to 20 years, we can reverse climate change. Because only in the living system, through photosynthesis, through the recycling of carbon, through the recycling of nitrogen, do we have a mechanism to pull out the stocks that have built up. You can build all the solar panels, but they're not living systems. They don't have this capacity to pull out the excess and turn it into living fertile soils. So in 20 years, we could reverse. And I'm sure both Ronnie and Andre will talk more detail on this. In economic terms, in economic systems, we can end suicides in the areas where we work, where Navdanya saved seeds, we train farmers in agroecology. Not one suicide among, uh, in an, among the organic community, not one. Because they're all debt driven. And the debt is driven by the chemicals and an unjust market. I feel we have reached a point, given that image of artificial intelligence and robots mean 99% Humanity is useless. I think this is our moment to say, no, humanity is not useless. 99% and the youth, here's a place for you. The earth is inviting you for the economy of care. That's the future, not the future of disposable people. And you know, there was actually an article that said, oh, a 99% being useless means they can create trouble. So to prevent them from being trouble, creating trouble, let us have the same companies that make all our gadgets to now give smartphones to everyone to play games and stay distracted with virtual reality. Um, the food and health crisis, I think so much of it has been discussed at this conference. It's in our hands. And this again is, I mean, in two months, three months, Two weeks, there's a reversal of degraded health. And in terms of the social system, I have not seen a place where farmers' first identity or eaters' first identity is related to food. When people first think of what am I eating, they then think of what is our community eating. They think of what are the systems we can build that we eat well. When a farmer is farming, the issue of Muslim and Hindu just disappears. I have done so many movements to protect the Ganges, to protect land rights. Everyone stands together. When our identity is through the earth and earth care, and we think of ourselves as earth citizenships, and we practice what I call earth democracy, all of these grounds of conflicts disappear, and peace becomes the way we live. So all of these interconnected issues is what we want to take up. I mean, we've all kind of lived most of our lives. And as senior citizens, we are going to be young. We're going to be intense. And in the next 25 years, we are going to turn things around. Well, thank you very much. I was, I was thinking this morning when I woke up um, about this day, December, December 8th, right? And I was thinking, well, what? There's something about December 8th. And then I remembered uh, 1980, December 8th, a guy who was uh, one of my heroes who said, uh, they may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. And John Lennon was murdered 37 years ago today. And, but uh, I think his, uh, his words and, and the, the sentiments that he spoke about uh, have certainly carried on. But we're in a situation where uh, the resolution to this catastrophe that we're facing, this degeneration of the earth, of the climate, uh, this degeneration of public health, degeneration of the culture, degeneration of, of politics uh, is approaching uh, what many uh, scientists and, and just ordinary people realize, the point of no return. Uh, we don't have an unlimited amount of time uh, to reverse uh, this degeneration that has set in and, 
you know, all 200 nations of the world that is set in in the, the communities where all 7.5 billion of us live now uh, and where our kids and grandkids are, are wondering what is going on. You know, I mean, is there a future, uh, you know, for our kids and our grandkids? I mean, for us. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are in despair. Uh, so I believe it's falling upon us and those like us across the world uh, to uh, rethink what we've been doing and to uh, figure out how we can move forward. Now, what I love about uh, Regeneration and this network, Regeneration International, uh, is that it is, it is a utopian or idealistic uh, worldview. Uh, we're talking about, uh, can we work with Mother Earth? Can we work with the global grassroots to not only regenerate the Earth, but to regenerate the belief and the hope in people that things can change. Uh, like I mentioned uh, in my talk yesterday, I mean, my 20-year-old son told me uh, last year, because I was asking him why aren't more of the kids from his high school, uh, you know, activists like I was, you know, when I was his age. And he said, well, Daddy, he said, uh, Young people know what's going on. They know, they know about the climate crisis. They know about the horrible situation. But he said, most of my friends don't believe there's any hope. You know? And so if you don't believe there's any hope to change things, well, why go to all the pain and suffering? I mean, he's seen uh, what the life is like for full-time activists, his mom and his dad and you know, lots of our relatives. And uh, we've got to we've got to reinstill hope. Okay, we obviously need to regenerate the biodiversity, the biological biodiversity of the earth, uh, and work in harmony with the animals and the and the forests and the trees. Uh, but we we have to have a movement that is diverse too. And uh, the plea I want to make today uh, is that. Let's connect the dots between the burning issues that preoccupy the people in our local communities, in our regions, in our nations, in the world. Uh, and the bottom line is that people don't wake up uh, every morning uh, worrying about uh, food and farming, you know, and farmer suicides and uh, the disappearance of the pollinators or the... Uh, the uh, you know degradation of our topsoil and our fertility and the the poisons in our food and so on. Some people do wake up thinking about that. I know I do, uh, but other people wake up thinking about their health problems. You know, are the problems of the people in their family the health problems? In the United States, forty percent of us adults uh, have degenerated health. Uh, and we're suffering from chronic diseases. It's the number one killer uh, of, uh, or number one cause of premature death. You know, people who wake up with health problems uh, need to be part of our movement too. So we need to connect the dots between deteriorating public health uh, and the food we're eating, the toxins uh, in the environment, and point out that this can be changed. We can change our diets. We can change uh, our immediate environment to reduce our contact with toxins. We can identify the degenerators who are literally condemning us to death, early death, expensive death. Uh, they don't want us to die too quickly because the last couple of months of our lives, they want to hook us up to those machines in the hospitals so they can drain out the last $60,000 in your bank account uh, before you go, you know. But the same corporations, the same billionaires that are poisoning us are the same billionaires that are selling us the cancer drugs and, you know, that are investing in these industrial healthcare systems. 
So health is a big, is a big one. Uh, if you wake up in much of the world, uh, what you're worried about is, uh, are you going to get through the day? You know, the poverty. Do you have enough money to go buy food for your kids? Or do you have any, any food that you've grown? You know, or are you going to get murdered when you walk out into the street uh, by some, uh, you know, uh, gang member? You know, it's like rural poverty, urban poverty, violence, the so-called war on drugs. These are intense issues for people. You know, we have got to start connecting the dots between poverty, unemployment, and regenerative food farming and land use. If you're talking to a, a person who is, you know, unemployed or working in, for example, the food chain in the United States, I mean, we got 20 million people working in the food chain. You know, the farmers, the farm workers, the restaurants, the you know, the, the truck drivers, the clerks, the, the warehouse people, 40% of people in the United States working in the food chain cannot afford organic food, you know. They cannot afford organic food. Uh, if you work at Walmart, uh, the biggest employer in the country, um, if you get food stamps, maybe you can buy a little, you know, a little organic food. But we have to connect the dots. Poverty violence, war, forced migration, deteriorating public health, these are all rooted in the same degenerate system that is threatening our very survival. And so as we go, hopefully from here, to build regeneration coalitions in our first in our immediate neighborhood or community or city or county or state. Um, let's keep that in mind. We, got, we do have a food movement and a farming movement in this country and a fair trade movement that is sizable. You know, I mean, we have done a lot of good things over the last 50 years in building this movement. But we're still over here. We got the food and farming movement over here. We got the peace movement over here, we've got the health movement, natural health movement over here. We got the movement for economic justice over here. We got the movement for you know democracy, that uh, that old idea uh, over here. But these movements are not working in synergy. You know they're working in isolation. The basic the basic rule of thumb in the, in, the, in the change community in the United States seems to be, you know what, my issue is more important than your issue. My constituency is more oppressed than your constituency, you know. And I want to get this money from this foundation so that my organization, my issue can continue. You know, we have got to open up a discussion uh, with the different segments of the concerned, uh, you know, people, uh, especially in the U.S., uh, to change this. The climate movement. Climate movement's gotten pretty strong uh, in the United States over the last 10 years. Uh, we're, we have exposed the fossil fuel industry uh, for the degenerators they are. But is the climate movement talking about there's two basic things we need to do to restabilize the climate? Are they talking about regenerating our soils to sequester carbon from the environment to bring us back to a, a balance like we were in, say, the year 1750? No. The leadership are not talking about this. You know, that's why the food movement and the climate movement, which should be working hand in hand, are not. Okay? Migration. It's like, have you heard anyone say that the solution to migration is not putting up a wall or tearing down a wall? The solution is, is prosperity back in the rural areas where the migrants come from. The reason people are coming to the United States from Mexico, from Central America, from across the world, 
is poverty and violence in their home communities. They would like to go back, most of them, to their home communities, but there's nothing to go back to because NAFTA and U.S. foreign policy and their own corrupt governments and the drug cartels and the, the gun manufacturers have created a hellish situation uh, there. So migration is connected, justice, poverty, health, all these issues. No one's going to do it but us. When you go back to your home community, please consider how you can broaden the conversation. We have to go out and talk in this country to every church group, every student group, every environmental group, every peace group, every social justice group. We need to start a conversation about how we can work together. Because if I am just a dreamer, if we are just dreamers, and this, this utopian idea of peace and justice and harmony uh, is just a dream, well, we might as well party down and give up. You know? I don't believe it's a dream. I think today is the beginning of a new era when we can regenerate the earth and regenerate the global grassroots and take care of business. Thank you. Well, I want to follow on with what both Van Dana and Ronnie have said and say that we actually have a crossroads. We have two clear futures. And the one we're headed on at the moment is is basically the extinction of us and our sp and every other species, excuse me. <coughs> the last, so in 2016, for the first time, the atmosphere had 400 parts per million um, carbon dioxide. Now, actually I shouldn't say the first time, the only other time we can actually look back where that had happened is about 600 million years ago and at that point, sea levels were 60 to 100 feet higher. That's 400 parts per million. By the way, um, we're 405 now and going up faster than ever. The last decade, we were going up at two parts per million per year. Last year, we went up 3.3 parts per million. That's a new record for the planet. And if you get the 450 parts per million, Excuse me. That is regarded by many scientists as what they call the tipping point to catastrophic climate change. A tipping point, well, you, to explain, you know, we've ha always had cycles on the planet. Sometimes there's a tipping point, there's an ice age. Then you get another tipping point and you go out of the ice age. What we're talking about is a brand new one and a world that will probably be on average um, maybe about 10 degrees Fahrenheit hotter. And some people say, oh, that's all right. Winters are going to be a lot better and we'll just turn the air conditioners up a bit more in summer. We'll be okay. But what people don't understand, it's... Oh, thanks, Fred. What people don't understand... It's, it's not the average, it's the extremes that cause the problems. Now, at the moment, the world is 1.25 degrees Celsius, which is about a bit over three degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was at the end of the Industrial Revolution. Now, I want you to imagine how much energy is needed to warm the atmosphere of our planet by th over three degrees. A good way to conceptualise it, it's the equivalent of many thousands of atomic bombs of energy is powering our energy systems. And this is why droughts are longer, storms are fiercer. And to give you ideas of, of what is happening, when Katrina hit New Orleans, that was the first of what we called the super hurricanes. Now, the scientists said we wouldn't get these to about the year 2050. And when Katrina occurred, everybody, and hit, hit New Orleans, 
Everybody was completely un unprepared because we'd never had one ever on the planet. Since Katrina, you know, there's been plenty. You know, Sandy's a really good example one of hitting New Jersey. Um, one called Haiyan that went through the Philippines killed over 2,000 people and left several hundred thousand people homeless. That was four years ago and many of them are still homeless. Well, let's talk about this year when Harvey hit Houston. Harvey is a one in 500 year event. And so they said, okay, look, let's see how often these one in 500 year events have happened in Houston. Since the 1970s, one in 500 year events happened one in 15 years. But a few weeks after Harvey, we get, we get Irma, a one in 1,000 year event. And thankfully Irma went a little bit to the west of, of Miami because it, if it had hit Miami, we'd, we'd have a casual account in millions. Similarly, a few weeks later, you get Maria that goes through in places like Puerto Rico at the moment. The majority of people in Puerto Rico still do not have power on. And Puerto Rico, is supposed to be part of the United States. It's one of the richer areas in the Caribbean. Think about the other pl places that have been hit. They're looking at decades before they recover. In my country, we've had three of these super ones hit. And where I live, we actually, we had two within three years of each other. The first one came through, destroyed all the crops, destroyed particularly the orchards. People replanted only for three years later to have it all wiped out again. And the vast majority of farmers said, that's it. We're not doing this anymore. It's, we're gone. You know, we, 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 it's not viable. Now, you know, the thing is this, is that these events now are only be going to become more frequent and stronger as we put more and more energy into the system. But the other one I want you to think of is this. Um, before the Paris Agreement, when they're talking about, oh, we'll, we'll let the, the world go to four degrees Celsius, um, that's about just under five degrees Fahrenheit. And they did some research on it and said, well, if we do that, most of the major coastal cities in the world will be underwater by between 2030 and 2050. I'm talking about New York City, I'm talking about New Orleans, Miami, you know, London. Most of the Netherlands will be underwater. And then if we start going to Asia, we talk about mega cities like Mumbai and Calcutta or Bangkok. Bangkok, there's 30 million people. Uh, Jakarta, 30 million people. And these cities are already going underwater like Miami in King Tides. You know, it's in, in the next decade or so. And, and, you know, Manila, another 30 million. Tokyo, another 30 million. And then the country of Bangladesh, 60 million. And I want you to think about the world at the moment, can we cope with two million refugees from Syria? No. 200,000 Rohingya refugees from Myanmar, Myanmar, Burma, going into Bangladesh. Can we cope with that? No. How do we cope with 60 million Bangladeshi refugees? And that's just Bangladesh. The other side of Bengal, West Bengal, you've got Calcutta. You've got another 40 or 50 million. That's 100 million refugees just there but we're talking about hundreds of millions of refugees. What sort of world will that be? That'll be a world of total chaos. The whole breakdown of law and order and society as we, as we know it. And so, you know, you want to think about climate change. It's not just we're going to get hotter and we're going to get more storms. We're going to destroy the society that we're in. You know, so is that a future we can accept? Is that a future where some people say, oh, we'll, we'll adapt to it. We'll, you know, we, we'll find people new jobs or move them. You know, we can't cope with what's happening in the Middle East. We can't cope with, what's, with, the, with the people coming out of Guatemala and Central America. We can't cope with the people out of Africa who are coming up to Europe. And they are moving because of climate change, because of, of the worst drought that they've had um, in 80 years. That's climate change. The Syrian crisis happened because of climate change. That, the whole of the Middle East went into a drought and there were food shortages and then farmers and, the, and then the, the, the local population started rioting. That's what they called the Arab Spring. And, and it's just, you know, basically, you know, it's still chaos now. It's still a war and we, we cannot deal with it. 
That's one future. But the other one is, and I think, you know, Ronnie uses the word dream, but I'd like to actually say it's not a dream because most of us here are already doing it. We have enough knowledge, we have enough proven practice that we can turn this around in 30 years. It took over 250 years for us to create this problem, but, but with the agricultural systems we have, we know that we can take enough of that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, put it in our soils, and reverse climate change. It's not about, oh, we'll, you know, we'll mitigate it. We can turn it around and quickly within our lifetimes. And we don't need any new technology. We don't need anything else to be invented. With what we know now and what we're doing now, we could turn it around. So all we need to do is scale it up, to get that information out, to change farming from one which is degenerative and responsible for up to 50% of greenhouse gases to one that can actually turn around climate change, but the other good thing we're going to do about it, we're going to solve the health crisis because we can actually make food that is nutritious and not toxic. We can restore our communities by, by making farming prosperous again. We can rebuild this new positive society and that is just by scaling up what we are doing now. In this room, we are the real climate change heroes or regenerators of this planet. And we've got to realise that, realise the power of what we've got, and do it. And if we do it, our children and grandchildren will have a wonderful future. And we have to do it. So thank you. Do any of you want to add anything to those no. comments? Um, we'll we'll uh, start turning the discussion to uh, the directions that you're interested in. So please gather, uh, please send your questions over. There's people in the aisles with pens and cards, and, and then we'll get to as many as we can. Um, one of the first questions that we received is, trying to solve all of these problems together at the same time seems daunting. Can we not start with soil and work on others like peace? Who would like that? I think uh, what well, the session, by connecting the dots, is precisely transcending the idea that these are peace, and you've got to work on peace and get exhausted, and then you've got to work on unemployment and poverty and hunger and health, and that each of these are separate pieces of work. No, they're the same piece of work, which is intensifying the biodiversity. Mm -hmm and taking care of the soil, and the rest just grows and flows from it. All the other issues, because they are linked, I mean, I think that's why we need to go, keep going back to the soil as the teacher, that when the soil is fertile and you're giving back organic matter, you know, all those different mycorrhizae are not saying, oh my God, I have to bring this, I have to bring the water, and the potassium, and my God, they're not getting exhausted because it's not separate pieces of work. It is participating in the energy of life, in the regeneration of life, as what you are. That being is the doing. And that's why the work we all do, the work you do, I think Andrew said it so well, we're already doing it. It's in the head it needs sorting out. I think the minds are colonized, and they're colonized in three ways. The first way is we declare nature as dead in the Cartesian framework and the mecha mechanistic world. Nature's dead, can't do anything. Therefore, you've got to put the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. That's why you've got to do the GMOs, because the seeds don't know what to do. The <laughs> seeds don't know how to grow from seed to seed and evolve and re re resist climate. So it's really nature doesn't know, women don't know, farmers don't know, they're empty containers. And this whole next model of Monsanto farming without farmers is we're going to sell you big data. Your heads are empty. We are loaded with the new oil. That's going to be the new commodity. No, we know. The roots know. The seed knows. The food knows. The gut knows. So that's the first colonization we've got to get rid of. The second colonization is because it was a fragmenting worldview, 
things were put in different silos. And we've spent good 50 years working successfully in silos because we were in a democratic welfare state where you organized around one wild species, you could eventually pass a law to protect it. You work around a particular river, you got the clean water. Now, in a period where everything's being dismantled, that silo work is not going to work. The context for the success of the silo is over because we are in the degenerated political system that doesn't care, doesn't listen, is dismantling what we built. So here the mind has to basically recognize that no more work in silos. We might have our different passions, but our different passions don't divide us. They just give us the direction for where we'll put more energy. But because everything is interconnected, our doing the regenerative agriculture work will create the peace, will stop the migration and the refugees, will solve the climate problem. And the third colonization that I think is the most serious colonization of our times is that wealth is the billions the billionaires stole from us. Wealth is well-being and our capacity to be well, to create well-being, the original name. And you know, we work with Bhutan, which said 40 years ago, we are not going to change GDP. We are going to look at gross national happiness. That's what they measure. They have a planning commission for happiness and well-being. <laughs> not how to facilitate the money makers with more money. How to protect nature, how to protect culture, how to protect the spiritual values of society. Very important in Buddhism. So I think basically it's an issue of right livelihood. And right livelihood begins with our relationship with the earth. The rest grows from there. So we should not feel daunted. We should feel liberated that we are not enslaved by all these false, crippling illusions. What are, another question came in. What are several things, are there talking points that we can point to as we speak with friends to give them hope about reversing climate change? Um, well, I think, I like to point out that we had a stable climate for, you know, the last 12,000 years uh, because the one thing is the food and farming and land use were in balance with nature. That literally photosynthesis is a miracle of creation. I mean, the plants suck in the CO2 and turn it into, they release the oxygen that we need to breathe and they put a considerable part of that carbon down into the soil through their roots. I mean, we can, we can reverse climate change within 25 years by simply looking at what the good organic farmers and herds people are doing around the world and scaling it up. Uh, there's 750 million uh, farms approximately in the world that's about uh, 3 billion uh, rural residents of communities. Uh, there's another billion people who are growing a little bit of food uh, in urban areas across the world. The rest of us, even if we're not producing food, we're eaters, you know. And we build an alliance between farmers and consumers. We can change it all while we improve our health, you know, while we restore reverence for all living things, the animals, the soil, the microorganisms. And it's, the proof is out there, it's happened uh, before, uh, and it can, it can happen again, and pretty rapidly. Uh, the, the climate agreement that was signed in, in Paris in December 2015 called Four for 1000, which most people don't know about. They know about the agreement to stop emitting fossil fuels completely by the year 20,000 of renewable energy. But this other agreement that's now been signed on to by 40 countries and uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, nonprofits around the world says, and we are gonna draw down the excess carbon from the atmosphere and put it where it used to be, in the soil, in the trees, in the grasses, 
uh, and that will restabilize the climate. Uh, farmers around the world are proving that we only need 10 or 20 percent of the farmers to adopt best practices. Farmers and herds people and people who live in forest communities uh, to reverse it right now. We have a question uh, regarding the Paris Agreement. Is it mandatory for this dream to be realized? This talking of regenerative agriculture and it's... For me to, unfortunately, it's not mandatory. It's a, a voluntary agreement. And despite that agreement, you know, that was signed in December 2015. On one level, it's good because we've got nearly the whole world signing it. The, but people just make voluntary commitments and they make these commitments. But the fact is, the following year, we see an increase in carbon dioxide by uh, you know, 70 per cent over the year before. So yes, I've got an agreement, but no, it's not actually doing anything yet. Things are, actually, are going worse. But I want to get back to this four for 1,000. This is the best kept secret in Paris that was signed on December 1. And it also had the major UN organisations, the World Bank, major researchers, the Global Environment Facility, which is the main uh, international group for, for funding, climate change funding. And this is a serious initiative. And I was actually one of the people who were actually from Copenhagen onwards that actually put a lot of effort into it. And I'm signature number, physical signature number seven on that document. And I think that's the most important thing I've, I've done in my life. But the reason why we want to talk about it is because on one level, we can look at the data and it looks hopeless. But on another level, we can see what we call the first green shoots of spring. And they, that is what we've got to concentrate on. You know, we don't, you know, instead of using the data saying, no, this is hopeless, there's nothing we can do. We do have good international processes happening. But I'll just get back to it. You know, we don't need to invent anything. Most of us in this room are already doing it. It's not rocket science. We just need to scale it up. And as Ronnie said, we don't have to get every farmer to change. But enough of us do it, and we change this planet for the better in many, many ways. Yeah, on the issue of mandatory, Copenhagen's collapse of the U United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the binding treaty, and sadly, President Obama played that role, coming down after his peace prize. <laughs> and he'd worked with my government, the Chinese, to say, let's get together. That's why President Eva Morales of Bolivia said, how can he be announcing that there's an agreement when we are sitting in the hall negotiating the UN treaty he says, that's a gang of five polluters that has worked on the rights of polluters. I'm going to work on the rights of Mother Earth. And that's how the UN, uh, how the draft framework of the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth came to be, and many of us joined. Um, I think as citizens, as people, as human beings, it is mandatory for us. The governments might have said, we won't we'll be bound. And our dear President Trump, who I'm always grateful for every morning because he accelerates the ob obscenity of everything. <laughs> and, you know, he makes it all so much clearer of why we have to change. Um, a, a quick side question. Someone asked if you could repeat again the current CO2 part per million statistics. Okay. Um, well, at the moment, we're... we're we're around, to be precise, it's uh, 405.3 parts <laughs> per million in, in the atmosphere. The, for the last 800,000 years, uh, it's cycled between about 250 up to about um, you know, 300. And when, when, in terms of where they've actually got physical evidence going to ice cores, they can go down to ice cores in, in, the, in Greenland and Antarctica, and they've got down to 800,000 years, and they get the trapped air, and they can measure it. And in, 
in the last 800,000 years, they've never seen anything um, as high as uh, 400,000, not even 350, <coughs> just a bit over 300. And what we are really in is what, what's called uncharted territory. They can look back at fossil records and sort of guesstimate, but the real trouble is we don't really know. But what we do know is that we're heading into a disaster if we don't turn it around, and turn it around quickly. We have a couple of questions that, that sort of correlate. I'll, I'll read all, actually three, I'll read all three, and I think you'll each have input. Uh, one is, I work with helping to educate chemical growers. Do you see any hope for bringing in their help with better management practices? And uh, related to that is, how do we transform conventional farming to regenerative agriculture? Specifically, how do we convince large-scale uh, conventional farmers to farm regeneratively? Followed by, how do, what's the number one thing we do to fight toxic big ag? So I think they all kind of connect. Well, the number one thing we do to fight toxic big ag is say, we'll be poison-free. My little plate every day will be poison-free food. And if I don't grow it, I'm going to look for the farmers who grow it and for the farmers to move towards poison-free for the fact that in this country, the entire agricultural economy was built on rewarding your use of chemicals and poisons, which was subsidized. Uh, and it meant small family farms disappeared. It meant that those who continue to do organic do it with their initiative. They're creating their local distribution systems. Most conventional farms now are not even owned by the farmers. I, when I was doing my book, Who Really Feeds the World, the data was 70% of the big farms are rented back from the financial institutions who take a rent. So in fact, it's apparently a big farm, but it's an indebted farm. We saw the small farmers get mortgaged and lose their land, but we are living in a period of landlessness. So I think the two things to do with the conventional farmers, first on the economics of it, and to show what the next step is, that the next step is there will be no farming for farmers. Even to repair your tractor, you'll have to pay a royalty. They're putting in software. They're putting in spyware into the tractors to collect the data on your soil to sell it back to you. So I think this projection, and my next book is going to be on all of this, I think the conventional farmers need to know the next step in that is deeper bondage, deeper crisis, deeper debt. And so, rather than cling to that failing and closing model, to turn towards the models that are working for farmers, for the earth, and for people. And second, the success. Like I said, not a single small organic farmer who, you know, our members, not one of them is in debt because they don't buy any nonsense. They don't buy poisons. So they don't get into debt. Whereas every chemical farmer is indebted. Every chemical farmer is indebted. Because these are ecological narcotics. The more you use them, the more you must use them. And with the world that's being created, your seed is patented, your tractor is patented, your software is patented, your data is patented, your insurance is going to be the, your big system in the climate change system. There is no way you can survive in that system. So I think we owe it, and maybe in the future sometime, a workshop with conventional farmers and organic farmers to exchange experiences, including the future. Just to follow on what with Bandana is saying, debt is the thing that is killing farming all around the world, and it's deliberately done. Farmers are deliberately being put into debt. Now in the, in the developing world, they're, they're now got microfinance saying how good that is. But that is a way to get hundreds, actually millions of farmers who have never been, have been too small to, to be in debt. Now they can get them into debt. As a result, around the world, in every country we are losing farmers. And we are losing millions of farmers every year. But in our sector, the organic sector, our data from iPhone shows we're the opposite. We are growing 200,000 new farmers every year, whereas the conventional system are losing farmers. So in one way, by a process of attrition, 
we will become the uh, major farmers. We are the fastest growing group of farmers and multi-products, you know, multiple uh, product producers in the world. You know, organic is growing at a rate around the world faster than any other agricultural group. That's one. But the other one I think is really important now, we've got to get rid of this mythology, you go organic, you get less yield. We have enough experts here under this roof who can show you, go, you can go organic and you can increase yields. I learnt from them and my yields went through the roof. We have enough knowledge that we can make farms profitable, take people out of debt and grow m more healthier food than we are now. And so what we really need to do now is training and education and workshops. That is the key. It's not a lot of money. You know, it costs around $100 million to develop one GMO. If we could get that money, that $100 million, we could turn this around in a few years with education and training. You know, that's the reality. The money's there, we have the knowledge, let's get it and start using it to go to farmers and show them, look, we can make you more profitable, we can get you higher yields, you don't have to use any poisons and we can actually grow far more nutritious food at the same time. And we can solve the biodiversity problem, we, we can fix climate change and we can stop things like rural poverty and the migration issues. It all gets down to changing farming and educating people and, and just training with what we know now. It's not rocket science, we're doing it We've just got to have the resources to, to scale it up. Um, I guess this next question stems from, uh, especially in America, money talks. And based on uh, what Vandana said last night, if the chemical companies actually had to pay the true cost accounting of the damage done, um, and in the news, one of the biggest pharma or drugstore chains is looking to buy one of the biggest health insurance companies in America. So with that, this question is, do you see an opportunity to um, scale the conversation by partnering with health insurance companies? Because they're paying the, they're losing profit to illness. Well, I think, I think in regard to this building, uh, connecting the dots and building a stronger movement, uh, our allies have to be the natural health uh, movement in this. In the U.S., for example, there's a hundred million people who buy nutritional supplements or visit acupuncturists or homeopaths or so on and so forth who understand that we have the ability in our bodies to regenerate if we pay attention, okay? And then we've got this movement talking about health justice, that everyone deserves access to industrialized medicine, you know? And these two movements are not even talking together. I mean, talk to a, talk to a nurse, you know, even a, a nurse who's a leader of the nurses' union, they know nothing about nutrition or natural health, typically. And uh, you talk to them about vaccine safety or something like that, well, uh, they're not very well informed, and partly because if they don't get vaccines all the time, they get fired. Okay, so we've got to open a discussion between everyone in the United States and Canada, Mexico, each of our countries who cares about public health. But we need it to be a broad discussion that includes, you know, food is the best medicine, Environmental toxins and toxic food are the main drivers of chronic disease and how we solve these. Yes, everyone deserves access to health care, but what kind of health care? We need universal health care with a focus on prevention, with a focus on nutrition, with a focus on reducing stress you know, and toxins in the environment and a healthcare system that allows freedom of choice for parents, for example, to decide whether their kids are gonna be injected with 53 big pharma vaccines before they're 18 years old or else you can't even go to school. Now, obviously there've been some vaccines in the past that were useful, you know, 
But are there 54 now that are a multi-billion dollar industry, cash cow for big pharma? So it's, uh, health is very important, but we've got to get the natural health community in our food and farming movement. And then we've got to engage these well-meaning but uneducated people, like Bernie Sanders is a perfect example. I mean, Bernie knows nothing about natural health and very little about organic farming. I mean, he's got great instincts. I think he's probably going to be the next president if they don't kill him before then. But we have two years, two and a half years, to educate that movement about regenerative food and farming and natural health. And if we don't do that, uh, we are gonna, you know, not going to solve this, this health uh, problem. Just one sentence. I think the same way in which the earth has been assaulted, violated, by declaring the earth as dead, our bodies, in the name of the same paradigm, has also been violated. There are more hospital-induced deaths in this country. And increasingly, every day in India, there's a new scandal. The fanciest the hospital become, the more people are dying. And the more cases there are. One of the biggest Delhi hospitals was just shut yesterday. Um, so I think we need to, I think our big contribution that pro provides the interconnectedness is the fact that living systems have self-organizing, self-generative, self-healing capacities. That's where the climate solution comes. That's where the natural health solution comes. That's where organic productivity solutions come. And I think what the world is waiting for is another paradigm to replace the failed paradigm of 200 years of a fossilized paradigm that came from the fossil fuel age. So now's the time for the regenerative paradigm, scientifically very robust, thousands of years of science behind it. That's where Ayurveda comes into the picture. And these little interconnections that allow people to find out where the true insurance lies. Because everything has been pulled out. You know, it's, everything is outside us. Fertility is outside the soil. Knowledge is outside our brains. Worst, insurance is outside our communities and the way we farm. I think also I'm talking about changing the paradigm at the moment. Billions of dollars are made by these companies because it's a sickness industry. It's all about doing something after people are ill. We need to move to a wellness paradigm where we, we prevent it. And at the moment, the World Health Organization is talking about what, what they call the, the global epidemic of non-contagious chronic diseases, such as cancer, diabetes, um, heart disease, kidney disease. You can go on and on and on. And it, it's an epidemic. What we know about this is that, you know, how can you say, if I'm, you cannot catch cancer or diabetes sitting next to someone who's got it. They're not contagious. They are from environmental sources. For instance, we know the uh, US president's cancer panel report sh showed that 80% of cancers come from environmental sources, and many of those are toxic chemicals. The fact is, we can prevent 80% of cancers tomorrow. We can prevent this epidemic of non-contagious diseases tomorrow because it's environmental. We fix up the environment and that epidemic disappears. It is very, very simple. And that's why we've got to go to a wellness paradigm and not a, an industry that makes money Ooh. when you're sick. Um, we have a question, actually a couple of related questions. Um, what to... Uh, well, first, how do you convince lethargic uh, U.S. consumers they need to change their buying habits? And probably even the bigger picture question is, what to do when people seem to not want to know the truth, when video games, TV, sports, junk food, iPhones become the opiate of the masses? Well, we have to, we have to look at who is listening uh, to our message right now to figure out how we can get everyone to listen. And... Uh, 
The mothers and the grandmothers are the heart of our 2 million organic consumer network. And especially uh, the mothers of young children and the grandmothers of young grandkids. These are the folks who are uh, in the vanguard, if you will, of this uh, food and farming and are starting to understand regenerative food and farming movement. So uh, I say concentrate your efforts on those with an open mind first, you know, so that we build up a critical mass. Uh, and also a lot of the millennials, uh, the younger people, are, they're showing signs of, uh, you know, they're changed. McDonald's and all these big companies are in a panic because they're seeing, oh my goodness, the millennials aren't buying our junk food, you know, at the levels of Generation X or at the levels of the baby boomers before that. And they're actually starting to think uh, about that. So it's, it's like how we're going to convince chemical farmers to change. Don't talk to people who don't have an open mind. You know, We're not going to get them to change. We take their market away. Maybe they'll change. You know, We talk to their kids because their kids are still <laughs> redeemable at this point. <laughs> Uh, if you've got a chemical farmer who's been diagnosed with cancer or something, that's a different story. I mean, I'm hot. we are supporting this non-Hodgkin's uh, class action suit against Monsanto and the other massive class action suits that are going to come down the road. But my belief is that we got, you know, in the United States, we've got 320 million people. We can't just randomly get into discussions with whoever is around us. Stop talking to people who have the personality disorders, you know. Stop talking to people who are brainwashed and, and move on to the women and the grandmothers and the young people uh, and the, you know, the, the odd uh, uh, others uh, who will listen. We don't need the majority of the public to come to their senses. We simply need the majority of the, the mothers, the grandmothers, and the youth. With that, we will change the United States and Canada and the rest of the world. I mean, the problem with the United States is that the rest of the world, they base their hope, you know, on what they see here. You know, I mean, if the Democrats hadn't stolen the nomination from Bernie Sanders and he'd have gotten elected president, the whole world would have been hopeful in the last 13 months. You know, but we've plunged the entire world into depression and hopelessness by letting fascists take control of our government. And we have got to solve this problem ASAP so that the rest of the world will have hope, you know, again. And we can do that. We are going to do that. Now don't hold back, Ronnie. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thought was, how do we take this back to our hometown without causing friction? Or is that okay? Well, I think part of what we discussed is how this is the way to overcome artificial conflict. Now, yes, society has been divided. And I find preaching is a sure way to accelerate friction because you put the other side on the defensive. But sharing what binds us, what connects us, and sharing it in a compassionate way, that that's the way you don't create the friction. We've got to be the change we want to see. We've got to do the change in a very compassionate way. And the lovely thing, you know, the Dalai Lama now is using the phrase and the karmapa, they've added a prefix to compassion. They're saying it has to be courageous compassion. It has to be acting with courage, inspired by compassion, knowing that we are. What is compassion? The common passion that you feel 
not in an enforced way, because, because you see the interconnections. You feel the pain. Feel the pain of the animal in the factory farm. You feel the pain of the hungry person. You feel the pain of the farmer on the verge of suicide. And I, I think this going back, remembering we are one humanity on one planet and developing that, you know, the vocabulary. I think we need, I think we're going to write a dictionary. I'll take the initiative. We wrote a dictionary on development. And on that, Ronnie, you know, it's not that the rest of the world looks at America and says, wow, no. We are forced and bullied to eat junk food. We are forced and bullied to have GMOs. We are forced and bullied. And we sometimes fight back. We didn't allow patenting of seeds in India. We have an article 3J in our patent law. He said, no, you don't invent life. Life creates itself. So we need a dictionary, a post-industrial farming dictionary. How can you call pesticides plant protection? <laughs> yeah, I think we just need another dictionary of vocabulary so people don't feel that they're being attacked. Because we are not about attacking, we are about growing. Uh, we have a question. Uh, how does a debt-ridden conventional farmer get out of the debt trap and turn to regenerative agriculture? It's actually very simple. You know, we, we can give lots and lots of examples. And the first one is stop, you know, change your farm and stop buying these unnecessary inputs. You know, we've had many talks here about the issue of synthetic nitrogen. That's a major cost, getting nitrogen. And you look at it, it burns up the carbon, it burns up the nitrogen. You know, just by getting rid of nitrogen alone, that's a major saving. Look at the, 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 the costs of buying pesticides. As you change your farm to a regenerative one, a lot of the, the, the current costs that farmers have to go into debt every year, they've got an overdraft, they've got a get that money to buy these things and sell their crop, uh, you know, one, your production costs are low. In my, in my case, in my farm, that's when I started to make money. Because when you, when you don't have to put out all this money and spend it, that's money that you have. The other one is also, really importantly, is looking at getting better marketing. At the moment, the majority of farms in the world, and that includes here in the US, are cross-subsidised because one of the partners has the real job in town and gets the money, while the other one plays farming and spends it and loses it. And that is the reality of most conventional farms. And you know, we can turn this around because the reason why that happens is because most food is sold for less than the cost of production. It's not the true, true price. And that is the other thing is where myself and others did well, we formed our own marketing groups and we took control of marketing. And we made the money. We got the higher prices, not the people in the middle. And, and that, is, that is the whole thing here, is how we as farmers can empower ourselves at every level so we don't have to borrow money each year to produce and we get a fair return for what we produce. In other words, we get paid more than the time that we put into it. I just don't understand it. You know, if any other industry, you said to people, look, you have to, um, for your job, you have to buy your desk, you have to buy your computer, you have to pay the office rent, and at the end of the year, we'll give you, and you borrow that money, but at the end of the year, we'll actually give you less money than it actually costs you to borrow it. That is what farming is at the moment. And it's, once again, it is not rocket science to actually teach farmers good economic management. So it's not just about good farming, it's thinking about the farm as a whole system and part of that is the economy and your budgeting. And I've worked with farmers all around the world and we've turned them around into prosperous farmers. It's not hard. And that's why I keep on going back to, it's about training and educating and helping farmers change their systems on every level and we take them from, you know, how can you say, the suicide epidemic. You have it in the US, I have it in this, we have it in Australia. People don't want to talk about it in India. But before that happens, 
you've got things like substance abuse. When people are under economic stress and debt stress, you get substance abuse, domestic violence, all these social problems that come with it. No one wants to talk about it. We can turn it around. When people are prosperous, when people are doing well, you know, these problems drop away and now we get, you know, what I want to use the word that Van Dana did. We get well-being, not just on the farm, but in the community. We change things around. And I'll, I'll get back to it. It's just education and training. It's not hard. And if we could get the money for one GMO, $100 million, we could turn this world around really quickly and simply. And we've got, I mean, one thing all three of us have in common is that we're all managers of farm schools, you know, or demonstration farms. And what I've, what I've learned in Mexico is that you can talk all you want uh, to people who are still using chemicals, uh, but if you can bring them to your farm and show them, you know, okay, here's what we're doing here, you know, and if they can see, we also had to set up in, in the nearby city an organic restaurant and farmer's market and grocery store and even an organic brewery for beer. Uh, and we had to organize 250 small producers uh, in the area to start being able to sell their products, you know, in the city. But I've found that if you show people, you know, and you're honest, you know, they'll, 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 this will open their, their, their ears. We can't just talk to people. Everywhere we are, it is extremely important that we map the best practices in our, in our county, in our region, in our state, and we have got to literally bring other farmers, elected public officials, media people to come out and see it for themselves, you know? And, and that's a good step, uh, I believe, uh, in the right direction because most people have never heard about what we're doing, what we're talking about. Uh, they, they think we're dreamers in the utopian sense. But you show them the reality of it, and they get interested. Like our 100-acre farm in Mexico, we don't have a well. We're like 86% of all the farmers in Mexico who do not have a well and who are never going to have a well, okay? But through capturing water off all the farm buildings and putting it in cisterns, by capturing the water like, like people did traditionally, in ponds and reservoirs, and then, you know, we use solar pumps to move from these ponds into our cisterns, and we use drip irrigation, and we use varieties that, you know, many of our cactus and maguey and so on, they don't need any water, but we use low water varieties, and it's just like, it's like a revelation to the school groups and the, and the farm groups that come. They have never seen this before. So once they see these people are making money, these people employ, you know, we employ 40 people on our farm, uh, maybe they'll talk further. But it's the young people that excite me because they come out, they see this, they say, I want to do this, you know. I have a question. Do you, will Big Ag co-op the, uh, the organic movement. Oh, wait. go ahead. <laughs> They're trying to. <laughs> There's an organic product business that they can co-opt. There's an organic thinking movement and an organic practice movement that is not co-optable. Yeah, there's this new thing you probably heard about uh, uh, regenerative organic certification. I mean, first of all, most farmers in the world that are farming organically are not certified. There's 2.5 million farmers in the world certified organic. And they have to be certified organic in order to be able to sell into the market beyond just their local area. But there's 50 to 100 million farmers around the world that are farming organically who aren't certified, you know? And there's another couple hundred million farmers in the world 
who have the potential to improve their farming to be uncertified organic producers, okay? But in the United States, especially uh, in a market economy where most production is not just for the local area right now, but it's for a broader area, it's very valuable to have organic standards uh, that are meaningful, truthful, transparent, okay? And fair trade standards too, okay? Well, now we have a government that is completely, uh, you know, in bed with the big corporations. And the big corporations can't sell their poison food as readily anymore, so they're buying out the organic. So this new regenerative organic certification is going to bypass that because we, the people, are going to get behind a standard that's regenerative, not just organic. So we'll be able to tell consumers, well, if you're concerned, you've heard about these uh, factory farm dairies that the government allows themselves to call organic, you know, or you've heard of these factory farm egg producers or chicken producers that are cutting corners. If you've heard about this importation of, of fraudulent grain from overseas that, you know, it's, it's the mafia in Turkey and, you know, Eastern Europe, uh, Central Europe that are behind this. Well, look for that seal, the regenerative organic seal. You'll see two seals, the USDA organic, which means, yeah, that's, you know, you know it's organic, more or less. But look for that second one. We got to do this. Uh, we got to have a second seal controlled by the people. Uh, but basically, we want to get away from the point where we need seals where we have local organic production for local markets, where you're actually looking the farmer in the eye, you know, who is producing your food, you know, and you're welcome to go visit their farm, you know, and your kids are welcome. And that is the future uh, that we're going to get around to, which is the way farming was done, you know, for 7,500 years really until the Second World War when we had this explosion, the green revolution, the chemical in fossil fuel intensive GMO, uh, junk food, uh, global marketed uh, system. So uh, let's, all, let's all support the Rodale Institute and all these other groups in the United States that are putting forth a regenerative organic seal uh, and let's explain to the public what it's all about. A couple of points. If you're really interested in the regenerative organic uh, standard and seal, after this, uh, Jeff Moyer from Rodale is presenting it, so it's a good opportunity for you to listen to it and have a talk with him about it. That's today. Yes, uh, I mean today, just straight after this session. There's a session that Jeff is putting on about it. The other thing I just want to say, what, what is actually happening is this is the big, big food and Big Ag are losing billions of dollars every year because of the growth of organic. And as a result, they feel unless they get organic lines, they will contract. So that's why they're buying things like Annie's Organics and everyone in them wants to have an organic <laughs> offering. So we're not going to be able to stop them from doing that. It, you know, this is a free world. We can't make a law that says General Mills cannot sell anything organic. But what, what is happening I want to get back to is local empowerment. What we've been doing in IFOAM is actually bringing local groups together as participatory groups of farmers, but also developing the local markets. And the local markets are the, are the ones where you can bypass these big chains. The local ones are where consumers and farmers can actually decide on fair prices. So as a farmer, you get a, a price that is fair, so you are viable, you have well-being. And in most cases, because we've cut out the middle, the middlemen, the, the middle segment that actually gets up to 80% of the value of any product that's sold, that you know, the consumers get, get the products cheaper. This is, this is a win-win, and, and this is the model that is actually being scaled up around the world. And it's working here in the US. In 2014, for the first time in 100 years, 
the number of farmers in the US increased. And that is because of the millennials going into the homestead, year, homestead movement, growing and selling locally. And they are viable farmers, and they are the farmers that are the future, not of just this country, but of agriculture. And, it, and when I talk about these green shoots of spring, this is a wonderful one, and we're seeing it growing. And, and we're, really importantly now for people like ourselves, who we wonder who the next generation of farmers are, we're seeing them, and they're viable, and they're smart, and, and they're doing well. We're almost out of time, and I apologize to the people that we didn't get to your question. We have one final question, and then I'll give you a moment or two to any closing remarks. And that is, each of you are not living uninformed, uneducated lives, yet you smile, you laugh, and uh, seem pretty happy. What <laughs> inspires, what keeps you going and, and gives you hope? For me, following my conscience and doing the right thing, has always been regenerative. People say, how come you're not burnt out after 45 years? Because I never worked against my knowledge, against the earth, against my conscience. And that is the way to regenerate oneself and smile and be happy and have hope. <laughs> yeah, I'm the oldest one up here. Are you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't feel in the least bit tired, you know, but I think there's a, I think there's an interplanetary force out there that when you get opened up to it, you get this strength and it makes you smile all the time. And I believe that we have, we can tap into this force that will make us invincible. You know, uh, it's hard to always feel that force that solidarity, that compassion, that whatever it is. I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, most of the time, it's there. And this is a big universe. We don't understand what's going on totally. We don't understand where it came from or where it's going or everything in it. But I think it's worthwhile trying to cultivate personal health, you know, mental and physical and getting out in nature and being in contact with beauty and the sacredness of it all and uh, maybe the sacred herbs too. I mean, I've always been a believer in the sacred herbs, but that's why I'm a happy guy uh, and I'm going to stay like that until, you know, I mean, I'm going to die at some point. Uh, but hopefully not before we've won. But I actually think I'm going to come back <laughs> in some form. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> but I'm going to come back to enjoy the fruits of my labor and all of our labor. So I look forward to seeing you uh, in any of those forms. <laughs> of course, the, the, the other one that helps is uh, fermented grape juice. I'm a, I'm a great believer in that. <laughs> But uh, look, I, I think in life you can be a, half, a glass half full or a glass half empty. And being a glass half full, it doesn't matter how bad the problem is, you can always find a solution. And in my lifetime, when I first started farming organically in, in the nine, early 1970s, we were regarded as nutcases, idiots. We were written off. Hmm. But in my time, you know, the last few years as being president of iPhone, you know, I have never had to write to one government saying, I want a meeting with you. Governments came to me and they wanted me to meet with them. That is the difference. And yes, it can seem overwhelming, but the fact is we are winning. And I want to get that across. We are winning. Those green shoots of spring are going to come up. They are coming up. We just need to go with them and not spray them with Roundup, and, and, and we will win. <laughs> <laughs> well, our time here is almost done. We do have a couple minutes if you have any closing thoughts or anything we didn't well, get Well, I think to. those were closing thoughts. Well, it's thank nice you. Yeah. Well, we're uh, honored and thrilled that, that you okay. shared your uh, words and wisdom with us, and thank you very much. Thank you.